students, let's have a show of hands from those who've got any idea what these scrambling soldiers are up to here, besides pulling army strings at Camp Gordon Johnston down in Florida. The jumping off point, that's obvious. And it's obvious that they're toughening up for a little job ahead. You just have to guess the kind of job. Maybe this land-happy scow gives you a clue of the way those soldiers are getting the hell out of there in a hurry. Don't worry, students, you won't be marked on this one. They've squashed a make-believe barge down on top of a jeep, thrown in a couple of 30s to make it seem GI, and now they're pretending to be shoving ashore and knocking the enemy back. Here's a good clue. Barbed wire beaches. Incidentally, the ball of the foot is placed delicately and courteously just below the shoulders. The guy on the receiving end likes it lots better, they say. How's the score, students? Bob wire blossoms on many a coastline these days. Norway, Holland, Belgium, France, Italy, Greece, Japan. It won't be long in some of those places before the enemy will see a scene like this. They're the amphibious forces of the United States Army. United States Rangers, the guys who strike without warning from the sea. First wave shock infantry, the fireworks. Guys who clear the beach of enemies so big a stuff can get ashore quick. And even in dress rehearsal, they don't fool. They're trained, these kiddies. Students of as rough a little nursery school as the brass hats upstairs could throw together. This is their play field. It's a little dirty out there, but when teacher has a couple of machine gunners throwing real slugs an inch or two above your tail, mud isn't such bad company. By the time the first of these babies rolls in, the beachhead has been securely established. They're Navy craft students, manned by a Navy crew and called T-boats. They're big, really big. Damn near as much stuff jammed inside as the Hoboken Ferry. 300 soldiers or 10 tanks is just a normal load. And with the guys as before, every move's as polished as a teacher's apple. No twists or angles these sand hogs haven't doped out long in advance practice so they could do it with their eyes closed. Invasion is a big business, students. Tojo and Adolf know that soon, somewhere, these guys will come riding the night, streaming from the sea. The first thunder clouds of a big storm. Right behind the rest of us, the storm itself. Finishing school of the amphibious command. The guys who start what we finish. Up in Coscock, Connecticut, Harry Powers and his wife, they live down on Suburban Avenue, took the auto out of their garage and put in a heap of machinery. Young Dick Powers and his kid brother keep the place tidied up so that father, Harry Powers, can get right to work in the garage making machine tools on subcontracts for the big airplane plants around Costco. The government calls this a four-man shop, Harry says. They don't count me and Mrs. Powers, but we work here too. They count Gene Salvatore, though. Gene goes to high school, but he comes to work at the garage just soon school lets out. And they count Joe the milkman. And there ain't been a day since the plant opened that Joe ain't showed up. One job ain't enough for him. When Joe gets through delivering milk to the people in Costco, he drives over to the garage, takes off his white coat, and gets to work. Joe and Gene used to be on the same bowling team, but ain't no time for bowling now. Sometimes the milk truck's propped out in front of the garage, 10, 11 o'clock at night while Joe's working this late. Ever since Pearl Harbor, Harry and his helpers have been working 16, 17 hours a day making these machine tools. 
tweezers, yokes, buck and bars, rivet and anvils, pneumatic hammer jaws, reamers, hinge pins, the machine tools they make airplanes with keep coming out of the Powers garage six days a week, 16, 17 hours a day. When Mrs. Powers ain't housekeeping or cooking for the men, she's down working with them. It's the same for the boys when they get home from school. Except on Sundays, none of them get any time off. Once Harry figured he needed a rest, he went off on a fishing trip, but he couldn't sit still long enough to catch fish. He came home the next day and went to work. But when the Powers are expecting a visitor, they get cleaned up. Particularly if the visitor is James Forrestal, who's under Secretary of the Navy down in Washington. Mr. Forrestal came to Cost Cobb because he wanted to see Harry Powers and his wife and his sons and his helpers. He wanted to give them the Army Navy E for excellence. It won't much of a day for weather, chilly, with a good breeze coming off the sound. I think there is no occasion about which, in which I have participated that I have had more pleasure and more pride in my country than the being able to give you this symbol. I congratulate you. Now the powers don't take much time off, as so I've said, but when you get a big flag from the government, you want to sort of break it out. And the flag looks mighty pretty to the family, flying over their garage down on Suburban Avenue. The same flag that's flying over other war plants, a thousand times bigger than the Powers place. But they don't hang around for more than the feast. They get back to work. Take a good look at the Potomac, boys. Or take your choice and look at Lieutenant Juanita Redmond, the redhead or her pal, Captain Ruthie Parsons, of the Army Nurse Corps. Who are these young ladies? Take a good look. Have a good listen. Juanita, do you think much about Patan and Corregidor these days? Oh, yes. Sometimes it seems as though I left Corregidor last week instead of a year ago. I bet you're glad to get out of that place. No, really. It's Heartbreaking to leave those girls and boys behind. Where were you on December 7th? I was in Manila, except December 8th, 14 time. I was on light duty when I heard the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor, but even then I thought it'd be some time before they started an Onassis. But the same day Pearl Harbor was bombed, Jap planes came over Manila. They took everyone by surprise. stricken, many people lost their heads. After the first raid, the Japs came back day after day. The damage was horrible. The day before Christmas, we were ordered to the town to set up field hospitals. And along the roadside, I saw the results of the Jap bombs. Natives trying to save their belongings were strafed on open roads. There was no singing of carols that Christmas Eve. After the time, I was transferred to Corregidor across the bay. Finally, six days before Corregidor fell, I was evacuated to Australia. This Japanese film has come into our hands, and vividly it brings back the days I spent on Corregidor. I know how desperately our men fought. By the time I left, munitions, food, and supplies were practically gone. As General MacArthur said, Never did an army do so much with so little. We all lived in tunnels like this under the constant bombardment of Jap planes and guns. This Jap movie shows the enemy climbing up the embankment for the last attack. They hit Corregidor with every man and gun they had in the Philippines. And they were a merciless enemy. I had just arrived in Australia when I heard of our surrender on May 7th, five months after Pearl Harbor. I know how our boys hated this moment. I knew a lot of them well, and many of them I had nursed in our hospital. They fought until they had nothing left to fight with. It must have been heartbreaking for General Wainwright, our commanding officer, whom we all loved, when he had to meet General Lama, commander of the Jap forces. The Jap
Jack must be proud of this thing. And they must be proud of their general. Yes, Manila, Bataan, Corregidor, all in Jap hands now. The news is different this year. Yes, I wish those men of ours that are held prisoners by the Japs could know that the help that they've waited for for so long is well on the way and that they're not forgotten. You're damned right they know, Lieutenant. Help is on the way. The kind of help we wish we could have sent them when their back was against the wall on Bataan and Corregidor. But it took time and sweat to build those ships, which are pushing their way across the Pacific today in ever-increasing numbers. And it took months of training to build a fighting army, too. But now we're rolling. Now GIs from Atlanta and El Paso, Green Bay and Three Rivers, are jamming the docks of Melbourne and Sydney. Guys and fighting equipment from the USA down under to do a little job. Guadalcanal, Buna, at two. That was only a beginning, Lieutenant. Only a beginning. Although ladies rarely celebrate birthdays, these young ladies are justly proud on May 14, 1943, the first anniversary of the founding of the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps. It hasn't been an easy year for the woman soldier. Despite efficient accomplishment of her duties, sideline quarterbacks have taken pot shots at her from every angle. Old timers eyed her with all the caution of a sourdough approaching a rattlesnake. Rumors flew thick and at random. And many a yard bird had it straight from the feed box that the wax were the Army's biggest problem since Private Snafu joined up. Yet one year after the birth of the Corps, the WAC has a 201 file that stacks up well with the best of them. He's serving with General Eisenhower overseas, so efficiently that he has requested an increase in the North Africa Company! unit. At army posts and camps throughout the United States, she's taken up not only the clerical or stenographic sort of duties she might have had in civilian life, but also she's been given new kinds of jobs requiring newly acquired skills. As a dispatcher for the Air Corps, a motor pool mechanic, a radio operator efficiently handling the new and complicated GI equipment. She's freeing fighting men for the job of getting the war over with in a hurry. Now that the WAC enrollment quota has jumped from 25 to 150,000, and they're appearing all over in increasing numbers, a lot of guys have an honest curiosity. Forget the idle chatter, on the level, what is this WAC outfit? The Women's Army Auxiliary Corps was formed by an act of Congress at the request of the War Department. General George C. Marshall, Chief of Staff, said that the use of available woman power in the Army would contribute materially to the successful prosecution of the war. One of America's most distinguished women, Mrs. Ovita kulp -Habi, was appointed director of the newly formed corps with rank corresponding to that of colonel in the army. Every whack is a volunteer. She enlists because she wants to. She's going in of her own free will to help win the war quickly. She's between 21 and 45 and must be an American citizen. First off, she gets a mental alertness test and then an interview with an officer who determines her suitability for the Corps. Then, if she passes her physical, she's sworn in and sent to one of the five basic training centers where she undergoes four weeks of tough basic training. The complete GI routine from typhoid and tetanus shots through military courtesy right down to KP. All of it except for the manual of arms. Both physically and mentally, the training is strict and comprehensive. And whether it's chemical warfare drill or Red Cross life-saving practice, she's got a lot to learn and do in one month. From here, she may get orders for duty at an army post, or she may continue her training at one of the six specialist schools where she will study further for a specific duty. Officer candidates are recommended by their commanding officer, then interviewed by a board. If they manage this hurdle, they spend six more weeks of study. The successful few are then commissioned third officers, 
second lieutenants to you. Each company assigned to a post is self-sufficient with its own administrative officers, its own PX, its own mess with whack cooks, and fatigue details. Here again, it's apparent that the whack is determined to prove she's primarily a soldier, asking no special consideration or attention. Why not? Well, for one thing, most of the whacks have a brother or a boyfriend or a husband somewhere in the service. Like this auxiliary whose son is in ODs overseas. Sometimes he's been wounded or has given his life and can't fight any longer. This officer's husband was killed in battle, but she's receiving the Purple Heart awarded him. It's her war too. Yes, it's their war too. And as the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps begins its second year of even greater and more expanded activity, America has reason to salute its women soldiers, all part of the same army, all working to win the same war, and all strictly G.I. Joining the fun, a jabbing, a jabbing, hunting the hun. And look at the job that they hand up to me. BP. KP. KP. And KP. Police in the camp or the trouble that's mine. You get through with this, then they stand you in line. They gave me for this, and they gave me for that.
moral snafu is the harder you work, the sooner we're gonna be Hitler, that joke.